Hey, good people, and welcome on back. Sammy Ash here, the executive director of the Ash Academy, and your host of our Inspire, Uplift, Engage podcast. This is a very special episode, part one of our parenthood discussion. Before we get into it, we have some reminders. This Saturday, November 21st at 1 p.m. Pacific is the second annual The Farm to Table, which benefits Food Share of Ventura County and Tender Life Maternity Home. Our partners, The Farm, based in Ventura, California, will be joining us once again for this social outreach. This time, we're streaming it live to Facebook. So go ahead and on over to our Facebook page and follow. That is facebook.com slash the Ash Academy, and you'll be right there on the front row. Uh, there will be yoga and meditation classes throughout and an importance of yoga and meditation discussion, plus a much needed mental health check-in, whether you've been working from home or you're an essential worker who's been in the field this whole time. We've got some self-care tips just for you. And it's also the final week of our Fall Career Arc Workshop. Join us a Sunday, November 22nd at 12.30 p.m. Pacific as we discuss cover letters and elevator pitches, the document that could get you in the door and the introduction that keeps you in the room. Now that we've got all of that out of the way, let's go ahead and get into the show. Hello, everyone. Uh, Thank you for coming on back once again for another episode of the Ash Academy's Inspire, Uplift, Engage podcast. I'm Sammy Ash, the executive director of the Ash Academy. And today we are doing things a little bit different. We usually cover, you know, identity, culture, career, and academics. Um, But I wanted to kind of wrap up this season of the show with some parenthood episodes because we're really big on parental engagement. um, And we want to hear from all those parents throughout the different phases of the children's um, kind of, uh, you know, life cycle. So children and pre-adolescence is this first episode for this phase. So uh, let's go ahead and get started with introducing everyone. I'm doing things a little bit different there too. So uh, Melody Gutierrez, uh, we would love for you to uh, introduce yourself, where you're from, uh, how many kids you have and their ages. I'm Melody. Hi, everyone. Um, I live in Ventura, California, and I have three little ones. My oldest is eight years old, Zoe. I have an almost six-year-old named Cruz, and then I also have my youngest, um, Ezra, who will be three in a couple of months as well. I'm awesome. sorry, four. <laughs> <Uh-oh>. <laughs> you know, you start having too many kids, you start forgetting after a while. <laughs> Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, and then also we have uh, my cousin, uh, Allison Gonsolin. So introduce yourself. <laughs> my name is Allison. I live in Long Beach, California, and I have a four-year-old named Armani. That's welcome. It. <laughs> <laughs> welcome, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, then next on the list is a friend of the foundation, Nia Johnson. She has actually been on one of our parent panels before during our uh, back to school um, town hall. So thank you for joining us once again, but introduce everyone to yourself. Thank you for having me again. Uh, my name is Nia Johnson. I have one son. He's seven years old and second grade named Bryce. I live in right outside of Atlanta, Georgia, but I'm from Harlem, New York. Awesome. Shout out to City College as well. Uh, (laughs) Yay. (laughs) um, Thank you so much for joining us again. And then next on the list is Tuli Roy Kerwin. So thank you. Um, Uh, Introduce yourself. My name is Tuli Roy Kerwin. Can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me? Okay. (laughs) (laughs) Um, My name is Tuli Roy Kerwin. Um, Actually, Canadian and American. and I have two kids, one son, his name is Cairo. He's uh, eight years old and my daughter who's four and her name is Tila. And uh, yeah. <laughs> awesome, thank you so much for joining us. And then thank next you. on the list is Ed Garns, friend of the foundation. He was on our Black Does Not Equal POC episode early on in the podcast. So it's so great to have you come back full circle to 
as we're wrapping things up for season one. Can't believe we're so far into these uh, episodes, but thank you so much for joining us. Introduce yourself for everyone who may not know you yet. Well, thank you for having me again. Um, I'm Ed Garns. I'm from Atlanta, Georgia. I'm actually bi-coastal now, so <laughs> I say California as well, <laughs> in addition to Atlanta, Georgia. Um, I have a six-year-old son. Awesome. Thank you so much for joining us. And I see John has joined us as well. Um, we cannot see you yet. So stop this video and see if it works now. Y'all see like this little cat thing doing something? Yes, it says looking <laughs> looking for the phone. I'm gonna leave this part in the episode because this is so hilarious. I get it. I understand why. Uh I found a um Ah, there we there go. We cool. go. Perfect. Yeah. All right. So <laughs> thank you so much for joining us as well, uh, John. Uh, we've been just asking everyone around the room to just say uh, where they're from, uh, how many kids they have, and then the ages. So. All right. Um, yes, my name is John, uh, originally from Detroit, now currently live in Raleigh, North Carolina. Um, and myself and my wife, we have a beautiful five-year-old little boy. Awesome. Thank you so much for joining us as well. Um, so this is really meant to be an open conversation um, just to kind of get us towards that parental engagement for all the academic stuff. But I think I wanna talk to you guys more about identity and like culture before having kids. So like before you had kids and like when you found out that you were going to be a parent, did you have like a good sense of self? That's where I like career wise. I <laughs> <laughs> I could say no. <laughs> and, and, <laughs> the reactions. Um, so yeah, let's start there. Uh, right out the gate, uh, kind of a personal re reflection. Like, did did, and then why or why not? So Allison, go go right ahead. You said no. Oh um, yeah, because I'm young, starting. Um, so I'm a first time parent. It was unexpected. So I wasn't really where I really wanted to be, you know, but. It just happened and here I am. <laughs> I mean, that's real. <laughs> um, it, hop on in, anyone else the next? Um, I can say for myself, um, I was, it was planned with our first child, um, David and I, my husband. Now, um, at the time we weren't married, we, I didn't really think it was important to be married to have our child. I knew he was somebody I wanted to be with and, you know, love is love. <laughs> so. Um, when we decided that we wanted to have kids, um, I was 28 when I had my daughter. I felt like I had a better understanding of myself by that point. Um, but you know, we're human. We still keep growing. We still just have to figure ourselves out because we change. It's always evolving. And so, um, I felt like that was a good age for me. You know, I was culturally and, you know, Hispanics tend to have kids a lot younger. And so my family also was kind of like oh wow you're finally having kids <laughs> so you know I was going to be the the crazy auntie that didn't have any kids and I love being an auntie but you know um with him things change so you know um a little bit career wise I don't I well you knew me when I was pregnant with my first child Sammy so we worked together um you know I was in an okay spot but it wasn't definitely somewhere I wanted to stay and you know even in that I have grown in my career I'm finally somewhere where I feel a lot more comfortable. I feel like I finally kind of found my place when it comes to work and um, things like that. So, but um, yeah, that that's kind of how it was for me with, you know, my first child. Awesome. Who's next? Did you have I, a good sense I, of I'll self? I'll go if I had such a crazy reaction. <laughs> Well, I was actually, you know, settled. My, my son was playing, you know, my wife and I had been married for about two years. So my son, you know, we did kind of plan to have, have children. However, I was stable um, in the sense that like I was working as a college professor. I was working um, as a basketball coach at a high school. But in the transition of me having my son, I decided to go back to school. So I also during the course of my wife's pregnancy and when he was born was applying uh, to PhD programs at the time. So uh, it was a, that made it a crazy time, like, you know, traveling across country <laughs> with someone in a few months old, strapped them in to go interview for PhD programs. So that's why I laughed because I thought about that process of 
you know, being stable and then transitioning to go back to school. So, um, yeah, I think I had a sense of self, but I also had to learn how to transition that sense of self um, in, a, in a new career remix with a child. Awesome. Who's next on in? I'll go. <laughs> can you hear me? Mm-hmm. I don't know. Is this mic not good? <laughs> no, yeah, we can hear you. Okay, cool. Oh, okay, cool, cool. Um, well, mine was really weird. I, <laughs> I was pursuing with Naya. We were in college together. And um, I was all ready to move to LA. Woohoo, from New York. I'm out of here. You know? And the next thing I know, we're just about to graduate, a few months left, and I'm pregnant, and I show the thing to my husband. I'm crying, upset. He's crying, all happy. <laughs> it was hilarious. <laughs> I was not ready at all. Um, I did not want to have kids at that. I was still, I was pretty old, but I just wanted to really pursue my acting. Um, and so came along Cairo, and the second one was planned because I'm an only child, so I wanted my kid to have a sibling, but the first one, definitely not. <laughs> and then literally um, six months later, nobody had a job. So that was even scarier. Oh, oh man. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The, these are the flashbacks. <laughs> but yeah, that's, you know, but that's real. And I think people need to hear that. Not every child, like we might want to romanticize the whole situation to people like, no, I want them to know like they were all playing. Like it might not have been that situation. They're still loved. They are still, yeah. <laughs> they're here for a reason, but not everybody was planned. Um, yeah. Hop on in. Yeah. Um, I, so I was very confident and sure of who I was culturally and who I was as a person, as a woman, but I still think parenthood and motherhood, it just doesn't matter. <laughs> it still breaks up the whole shebang <laughs> of who you are <laughs> as a, you know, to, you know, it's still a transition. I don't, if you know yourself, if you don't know yourself, I mean, you, cause you have to then get to know yourself as a parent. And that's, that is, blowing anybody's world um, for the most part, I think, especially me because I didn't have that much experience with little people or babies. I wasn't like gushing over little babies as they walk by or, you know, as they're in the cribs or whatever. I was like, no, I'm not, I don't want to hold your baby. It's too small. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I really, I know what you're talking about. <laughs> yeah, I was just not that, like, you know, when they in middle school, we can cook, we can kick it, yeah, I'll take them to the movies, we ch I need full sentences, and, you know, um, yeah, I was not, like, the baby, I was not in that world at all, I didn't, like, babysit for, you know, friends and family members, um, I've always worked with kids, but they were very, they were older, so, um, I think though I was sure of myself and comfortable with myself, it was still a surprise. He was unplanned. I didn't even think I could have children. So it was um, like, what? What did what you talk about? <laughs> what happened? <laughs> Literally at the doctor, like, are you serious? <laughs> Where did that come from? It was um, quite a surprise and a blessing. Um, but I really didn't think it would happen without some, you know, medical procedures and help and things like that. So um, it was it was a definite change of life. <laughs> um, yeah, so career wise, I had quit my job, actually. Um, and it's like Superstorm Sandy had happened. So I actually stopped working even before uh, that. And I don't know if you guys remember in New York, it was like a big sand, the Sandy hurricane or storm had happened. So I stopped working even earlier. And um, excuse me. <laughs> Thank you. Hi. Hey, welcome to Mother. <laughs> <laughs> <Hi. laughs> um, so, yeah. <laughs> coming in as a surprise <laughs> how appropriate yeah uh, <laughs> um, but yeah career wise I, I just left my job and was like two lead work artists so I was planning to get my band back together and start traveling and you know life said no <laughs> not right now <laughs> So, you know, we make do and we, we, we make the change and we make the best that would um, God has for us. Absolutely. Now, John, hop on in. And a late bird. Um, I'll say we didn't plan. We did a lot of practicing, but we didn't plan. Um, 
so uh so when i was pleasantly so i, I personally you know i've always want fatherhood and being a parent was one of the things like i was like yeah i want to do that um but in terms of like being self-actualized like i, I don't think i was i was at the I guess the precipice of me becoming self-actualized. Um, I was working in higher education, but then I started to become jaded and understanding like higher education and the bureaucracy that comes with higher education and realizing that at the time I was running a retention program that was hyper-political. So it really was, it was good looking, but it wasn't good in terms of like really doing things. So for me, I was mm. getting burnt out of that. And then um, in, in that process, I started to realize like, hey, maybe I want to do something that allows me to be a little bit more flexible in terms of time um, and not bring homework. And so it was kind of like, that's when I started like, making that proverbial shift to like acquire different skills to then make that shift to do so as well. Because then uh, higher education also gives you that trap where you have to get an advanced degree to continue to go forward. And I didn't want to the, the time trap was the thing I wasn't willing to try to do in terms of uh, trading time for money um, because I knew it was still taking me away from being an active parent in that regard, um, the way it was currently constructed at the institution I was working at. Um, so it was me peeling back those layers from a perspective of saying, hey, what do I wanna be when I grow up? Uh, because now I have a responsibility and to feed a, not just my wife, but make sure that my child is fed as well, so yeah. Um, he's accelerated that process of making me become that much more actualized and so you'll probably hear him as he's roaming around here as well so now i totally i i get it he's, he's gonna pop in about four or five times especially once he realizes that i'm talking on the zoom call he's gonna show his face so <laughs> i think the only one i told that it's okay if they're in the room was allison but yeah this is the one episode bring the kids on in that's fine <laughs> <laughs> we're not talking about anything that deep although i did start with a deep question um and here's another one um did you think you were ready when you found out that you were going to be a parent no no <laughs> <laughs> and why or why not actually no um again i wasn't making the money that i was I, i'd like to, uh, to be making at that time um we were at, we were actually the rob, robbing Peter to pay Paul in in some of that 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 predicament, but luckily um, we right you know got got here and got the ship tightened and we're back we're, we're better than where we are obviously where we started, um, but just also from the perspective of realizing that you know we both Santana and I my wife we both have our own predisposed experiences with our own childhood that we probably be needed to unpack, especially myself in the sense of, you know, my, my father died when I was young. So it was me realizing, well, now I have to give him all the things that I didn't get. And then I'm trying to figure out what does that mean? And so for me, like all of those, that pressure and that anxiety of, hey, I can't mess this up, but there's no manual for this thing. Um, that's where it was like that. I'm like, oh, by no means am I ready. And again, I'm still not ready. I have a five, again, he's five years, he's healthy, but I'm not ready. I mean, I'm, I'm still learning on the fly, how, like how this thing works, so. I have three kids and I'm still not ready, so. <laughs> 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 I mean, yeah, because you, you know, you, you always kind of, when you, I don't know for everyone else, so I can't speak for them, but I can only speak for myself in this aspect, but you know, the moment I gave birth to my daughter, it was so surreal. And it was just like, oh shit, what did I do? <laughs> 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 she was planned. And, you know, it was just the realization, like, oh my God, like I am fully and utterly responsible for this tiny little person that, you know, I, I mean, you just look at them and, you know, I, I think most parents can agree when you see them, you see like, life and just like you want to give them everything you see all of the things that you want for them that you didn't have and at that moment it, it's it's perfect it's a beautiful moment don't get me wrong I mean it, it was magical I guess is the best way I can put it but you know as you start going along and those little personalities start to develop and you realize you know what I want for them they're still their own person, you know, and they're figuring themselves out. And I, you know, um, to kind of go back to that, you know, you have an idea of who you want to be. Um, I thought I knew myself, but as a parent, you, you're still figuring that out in a lot of ways. I mean, you know, my daughter's eight years old and, you know, because we're at a different level now, it's, it's a different type of way I have to address things, you know, it, 
it's a constant juggle. It gets tiresome sometimes, you know. <laughs> I mean, I think for any parent, you know, but you, I think for the most part, most parents go into it just wanting to do their best and knowing that we're not going to always do our best in some of these aspects on how we're trying to teach our people, our people, our little people to be good people is really, you know, a struggle sometimes because, you know, um, just getting them to understand like, hey, you can't act this way because <laughs> it's not good. You don't want to be that type of person. You know, you don't want to do certain things because it's all a juggle and you struggle with it from day to day. And sometimes you're going to feel like you fail. And sometimes you're, you're going to see your child, you know, really rise up to the occasion sometimes. And that is an amazing moment when you get to experience that with your kid, especially when you hear um, them with other people. I think that's been our true testament is hearing how my kids interact with other people when I'm not around to correct them is the true testament. And I, you know, that's something I'm like, wow. <laughs> there are people tell me and I'm like, oh yeah, you know, yeah, we did really good teaching our kids. <laughs> so for the best, you really do. I mean, through a lot of it, you're just really hoping for the best throughout it all. <laughs> awesome, awesome. Yeah, I, I, I thought I was ready. You know, I, I was hyped, you know, that, that first year, everything was going well. But as I was transitioning back into my PhD program, I was going to leave Atlanta, a place of a social support, blackness, power fist, and we were moving to a racially hostile space. And I did not anticipate the pressure of raising a child with the threat of death every second of the day. And so that's what I was ill prepared for. Cause in my mind, I always saw myself raising my kid in Atlanta, go over grandmommy's house, you know, cousin's house, but raising without social support in a, in a heavily racialized space, I was not ready for. And then something that creeped in probably because I was in a racialized uh, space, I never subscribed to the, the traditional notions of manhood. Like, you know, me and my wife, we have no gender roles. I can change a diaper, I can cook, I can clean, you know, but it was something about these, these, these toxic notions of what a father should be doing that started to creep in as I began my PhD program, because here I am making this financial sacrifice that a lot of people don't understand. I am doing this for my son. So, you know, I had to get through that first year of being in that racialized space of getting away from those notions that I put on us from America and these white notions of what fatherhood is supposed to look like and get back to redefining fatherhood for myself. And that meant also uh, sidestepping some things that my parents did with me that other people didn't understand why I was raising my child a certain way. I think they get it now because of he's emotionally mature, can handle different things, but we took a lot of flat for, for me, you know, deciding to go back to school as my son was just, you know, being born. So it was, it was rough. It was rough. Still is rough. I mean, it's a journey. <laughs> but that, that first year, I was like, oh, <laughs> dad is stressed. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. How far then? Who's next? I, I will go. Um, I would say I wasn't ready due to me being very young. I'm only 24. I had my daughter when I was 19, 19, yeah, 19. She's four now. So, um, yeah, I would say I wasn't ready at all, but I definitely would say I learned a lot along the way. I, I have patience now I'm learning myself and, you know, how to be a mother to a little person is it's, I wasn't ready at all, <laughs> but as I went on and, you know, continued to, cause I'm a single parent and I do it all by myself. So it was, it was really difficult, you know, having a newborn baby and just, it was just like crazy, but I would definitely say that I'm in a better space now that she's four. And I went through those four years by myself. I feel like it really made me like stronger as a person. And I don't know, I just wasn't ready, but I feel like, you know, I'm ready to take on the challenge with her in the next few years, you know, but yeah, wasn't ready. <laughs> I'm hearing a lot of it's a it's a journey it's a journey thing so it's not you're not going to be the same on day one as it is a few days in you still may not feel ready but go ahead Naya. I had actually Rob Barron told me this that I will never forget <laughs> if you remember uh Professor Barron mm -hmm. um I there was an event at City College I had already had um my son Bryce and I was 
literally exhausted, <laughs> but I had to get out and see people, right? It was one of those moments like, I need to converse with other people besides baby stuff. And um, he's like, how's it going? And I was just like, I'm here. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, the baby's alive, I'm alive, <laughs> you know? And he said, every, every time you think you've got it, the phase changes. And I always, when I get frustrated to this day with a seven-year-old, I think, and I think um, Melody also said this, and even it, when it, you got it, you're in this groove, you're in this routine, and then it changes. There's different, they're different, they're growing. And then what you have to talk, your conversation is different, your discipline is different. So it's constantly this like moving post, right? of what worked at one or two is not going to be the same at seven and eight um, or 10. So it's like, I kind of wish that parents knew that beforehand, like somebody would yeah. tell us it's okay because the post will change <laughs> and you're not going crazy. And it's just, it's these, these are phases and they will change and you have to kind of like be flexible with it and forgive ourselves. And, um, like Allison said, she's really young. I was an older parent. I, I was 35, 35 when I had my son. Um, and so though I knew myself, like I said, as a parent, I didn't, I had not a clue. And I read books and I watched movies and then I had to talk to people with kids. And I was just like, okay. I walked into the baby store with my mother and I never forget, I was like, I wanted to turn around and run. It was too much stuff. It was, it, it was overwhelming. It was just like, you know, people give you unsolicited advice and it just mm. becomes extremely heavy. And I think um, we're not honest with people enough and ourselves that it is overwhelming because everybody parents different and how your parents may have parenting you is different because our children will be different, right? We're, we're raising children in a completely different society. So I think all these things, uh, you know, I tried to get on mother groups and they all seem like crazy. <laughs> like it was just, you know, one extreme to another. It was like, where do you find your tribe? And so I think that is, um, you know, we don't talk about relationships changing between the friends you had before you had a baby and family. I mean, that's, it is such an emotional roller coaster um, that, you know, I think as you're pregnant, I actually went to therapy when I was pregnant because I needed to make sure I got some of that out before I pushed out a human being, right? I was like, I need to get some of this because I'm overwhelmed and I, I don't know, you know, um, where, how this is going to go. <laughs> so, um, you know, the support that I try to give to new moms is just like, you're not, you're not going to know. You're not supposed to know everything and it's okay. Trust your instincts whether you are a baby person or not. And, you know, take the advice a little bit of time. Some of it you'll throw away. Some of it you'll keep. Some of it you'll remember seven years later, like it's a phase. <laughs> it's okay. The goalposts will change. And so, you know, I take it in good days and bad days. Today, we had a great day. Yesterday, might, tomorrow might not be so great and it's okay. So, you know, I wish that, you know, more people would give that to new parents, no matter what age, um, women and men that, you know, what, what worked for our parents or for us necessarily won't work for our children. And we're going to have to keep, you know, figuring it out. And nobody's really planned or unplanned, completely ready for this roller coaster journey. <laughs> awesome. Now, Thule, uh, I think you're the, the last. Yeah. The... <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I, my cousin actually had a um, I, her daughter is like seven months younger than my son. So I was watching her go through this as I was pregnant. So I was a, a well, I thought I was a little bit prepared. I was <laughs> zero preparation. <laughs> they hit me like a brick. Uh, I mean, my pregnancy, I just kept thinking, my son's going to die. My son's going to die. So I was like, oh, no. it was like this panic all the time. I don't know. But like, all the sins I've done when I was a teenager, all this shit I did you know like I, it's gonna come back to me now so that was a fear constantly so I, I didn't know if um, everything is gonna be okay and luckily and to God everything went great and um, you know I had a healthy baby boy and all that was great but I, I wasn't really prepared be also because my husband is from the Caribbean from St. Thomas so 
he's African American, I'm Indian from India, completely two different cultures. Um, it was a real hard transition trying to figure out how to merge the two cultures as you train your son, um, even now harder with the daughter. Um, but it was a learning experience. So what I thought I knew growing up, and I grew up without a dad. So, you know, I was like, well, I don't know what you're going to do, but I know what I'm going to do. <laughs> right. And so it was like every it was conflict constantly because I didn't know what a man does. And it was kind of really beautiful to see that relationship uh, blossom. It was really nice. And I felt like I got to witness what a father does. And that was the really great part on my end. But it was such a growing experience. And it was easier the second time around with my daughter. But again, it's a girl. It's different. New things you learn. But um, those two cultures coming together, learning and different things just being thrown. I, I was one of those parents because like Naya said, unsolicited advice from all the parents. I was like, oh, I gotta keep up with the Joneses. I need that <laughs> particular stroller and I need, I spent so much friggin' money, man. And we didn't have jobs. So I'm like, not sure how that worked out, but <laughs> it was stupid. <laughs> and my daughter got everything hand me down. I didn't buy a single thing for her. so. Awesome learning experiences. So yeah, I was not by any means prepared that, that I thought I was. Mm -mm. <laughs> well, that's a perfect segue into kind of the advice that you were seeking for people or like, so what are some of the like main questions that you would ask um, and then share who you were asking, like other parents? Did you have like friend groups who also had kids? Are you talking to your own parents? Um, any other relatives, but yeah, what are, what are those questions that you were asking and then who were you asking them of? I, I guess for me, I felt like it was a lot easier to ask strangers. <laughs> um, <laughs> some things because, you know, family is family and you ask certain questions and they're just like kind of giving you the side eye, like you should know this already, but you, know, you don't know sometimes and they don't, you know, I don't know, like, my family, they're very loud and talk about a lot of things, but they, they don't necessarily know how to have the in-depth conversations about serious things. You know, they, they would try to avoid most of that most of the time. So um, I didn't feel like I really had much of sport, even though they were very happy for me and there for, you know, my kids and everything like that. Um, when it came down to really asking some serious questions about, you know, how should I address certain things with my kids and everything, I, I usually, they usually avoided those kind of questions. And, um, you know, as you know, Sammy, I have a very <laughs> um, strange relationship with my family who I, I don't really have much contact with right now, but um, for very good reasons and personal reasons, you know. Um, so for me, you know, I did try to go to the mom groups like Naya said, you know, and yeah, they're, they're batshit crazy. I mean, these women are just... <laughs> They are, they just look for any little thing to, to say, I'm a, you know, you get these internet moms that think they're the perfect mom and they put this display on and you feel like you have to live up to that standard. And I, here I am feeling like, I don't know anything about anything. You know what I mean? Cause really when you, you, when you become a parent, you know, you have an idea of stuff and then was it out the water and you're like, oh, I, I don't know anything. And you're really, you know, trying to figure it out. So, you know, I, I tried that for a little bit and <laughs> It, it wasn't, sometimes it was helpful and sometimes it wasn't, but yeah, I definitely learned that, you know, um, you have to be careful what you say and put out in the world sometimes because there really are just people who do not understand where you come from, don't understand, you know, that they don't know you, you know, so it, it just depends on, you know, and even with friends sometimes, and like I said, with family, you know, what I would perceive as, you know, I need help with this, you know, some, like I said, sometimes my family wasn't helpful in it. And I know there are some people that feel that way too, that sometimes they can be supportive in all the fun and all the cute things about kids and pregnancy and whatnot. But when it really came down to the hard questions that I needed support in, I, I had to look to professionals, um, medical professionals sometimes, you know, to get that answer because they just, I don't know if they just didn't know how to help with it or they were just afraid of the conversation. So what would be some of those questions without giving any like personal information, but like. 
I, I mean, the from a female aspect, I think, especially when you give birth to a child, what your body does after that baby comes out is, yeah. is craziness. You know, whether you had a C-section or you had a vaginal birth, you know, I, I had both, you know, um, my two oldest were vaginal births and my third was a C-section. And so, you know, I, I didn't really have anybody to tell me what my body was going to do after that fact. And I, I just found it so strange that, you know, and I think it's part of the culture too, that, you know, you just don't talk about your goods. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's just like, they just don't want to talk about it. And I found that so strange because I'm such an open person and, you know, I don't have a problem talking about those kind of things. And then anytime I meet a new mom that, you know, is like, oh, what should I expect? And I'm like, oh, well, let me tell you, darling. <laughs> I wish somebody would have taken the time to tell me what it was. Be prepared for this, 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 not the commercial stuff, you know what I mean? But how to take care of your body after the fact was really um, something crazy that I just didn't realize nobody wanted to really have that conversation. So I don't know about the other ladies here, but I know for me, that was, that was definitely something that I thought was kind of odd that, you know, talking about our body and what happens after pregnancy and, you know, childbirth you know, how to take care of yourself, the self-care part of it afterwards is huge. And it's so important, especially, you know, it's your body, it's repairing itself. How do you take care of it? And so I think that was one of those things that I felt like, um, you know, I didn't really have some support in that, but I was able to find it in other areas. Yeah, I, I, I made it in the, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. I, I was just going to chime in with her because I, I was fortunate after I gave birth to my son, the hospital that I gave birth, which actually doesn't have a maternity ward anymore, sadly, um, they had a breastfeeding group, which was so nice because you got to go with all the moms that gave birth there. And we spoke about all sorts of things. And they were strangers. So that made it nice because, yeah, family sometimes hard to deal with. And they, it was really great because, they, you know, you spoke about your boobs or oh, it's numb or whatever <laughs> and, and you know like and I had two c-sections um so I was like I couldn't even get up to breastfeed and there's so many issues so that was a nice part but I think one of the problems is that women just judge other women when we really should be coming together and helping each other out and I really wish also somebody told me hey listen after like six months when you're healed get back in the gym, you know, do these things because when you have the next one, it's, you know, it gets harder and whatever. And as you age, like I'm 45 now, it's like when you age, it gets harder and harder to get fit. And now I'm like struggling like crazy to get my body back. And they're like, oh, you're never going to get that 25 year old body again. I'm like, what are you talking about? <laughs> right? So as I wish like people would tell us stuff like this. And I wish women would be able to give, um, advice like I had certain people were like oh I read seven books I was like so who cares like it, it doesn't do anything I wish you'd give solid ground you know loving advice that would be helpful and non-judgmental and it's okay that we're all different women from different cultures different backgrounds we do things differently you know everybody has a grandma who's giving them some crazy advice right and it's nice to be able to share that with everybody and we can learn but I find when I went through my son's pregnancy, especially most women um, were quite judgmental and that was hard to deal with. So I was happy that I had my cousin who was really supportive and because she went through it six months ahead of me and I had that breastfeeding group, which was very helpful. So go ahead, hop on in, Ed. <clears throat> Ed, where are you gonna hop, where are you gonna hop in? Ed? Oh, sorry. <laughs> you, you, when you about to start, start talking deep, the internet want to go out. You know, they go, you about to talk about some black stuff. <laughs> okay. So, um, you know, for me, I was very intentional about not repeating my parents' mistakes. You know what I'm saying? So I did. I leaned on my village. I leaned on. Luckily, I have other uh, other black men in my village who had kids, you know, I had my kid, which was society considered late, you know, get in corners because what, what I, my major question was, how do I raise uh, a black man that is emotionally expressive and comfortable with himself? 
I think one of the messages that I did not get, I got it from my grandmother, but I didn't get consistently when I was younger is how to express emotions. Like when you are hurt, when you are sad. So, you know, a, a level of emotional maturity is what I felt my child would need in this world. So I ask a lot of questions about, you know, black psychology, um, about discipline, about being in, 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 in white spaces and what that meant uh, for black children. And then just, just to be happy. Like we, we forget that we want to raise happy kids. How can I not take that trauma that I've gone through, the, the mistakes of my parents, and then just put this on somebody else? So I was very intentional about asking questions that will create a new experience for my child and also challenge me in areas that I needed to grow. I asked people straight up, what are some things I have to change about myself in order to be an effective parent? And, you know, one of the things was patience. You know, I, I guess being an educator, you know, you educate for a long time. Your patience is like this thing now because the students are not what they used to be, you know. And I don't, I, I think in this age, you know, just that learning process and being excited about learning, I don't see that anymore. So having a level of patience is something I had to learn. And then I found myself leaning on my father's teachings and my grandmother's sayings. You know, my grandmother has basically helped hold this thing together, even up there as an ancestor, and just leaning on that advice um, and just not being hard on myself. Like, I'm a, I'm a person that wants to do everything, not necessarily right, but to a certain level, but, you know, just advice on understanding that parenthood is a journey. <laughs> you're going to have some good months, you're going to have some bad months, <laughs> but, you know, as long as you're not in the emergency room <laughs> and as long as they're not <laughs> with a therapist, I think you're doing okay. Um, so I was very intentional about new experience for my son and giving him the tools to fight early when these dehumanizing messages came to him. Because uh, even in this racialized space we were in, he was on the playground, got pushed off by a white sister, and they said, this is our playground. Um, and he was like two. And then we were looking at daycare centers in this racialized space where I'm getting my finishing my PhD. Um, Someone ran across the room and got in front of my son, who's two years old, said, stranger danger, you can't talk to these kids. And I was like, wow, you know what I'm saying? So I needed a lot of advice on, you know, the racism starts out the womb, you know? So that's that's what I did, man. And it's still a learning process, man. Some days I feel like the best father in the world. Some days I just pray to the ancestors to come down and save me. And that's real. Um, who else, uh, any of those questions that you were, uh, those burning questions that you asked people, uh, what were they and who did you ask? Um, I would say my grandmother, because my grandmother, um, she's very good with kids. She had a childcare, um, she had her own family daycare and everything, but it was a lot of questions like, how do you know when the baby is full or like, um, is it okay for the poop to look like this? Like what, you know, how they're teething and the poop is different. And it's like, what is this? Why is it up the back? Like, you know, just certain things like, is this normal? Is this okay? Am I, am I doing this right? Like, it was just questions like that, that I would go to my grandmother for. And there was some questions that I didn't feel comfortable with by asking her. Cause I would feel like, okay, maybe I should know this, but I don't want to feel like, you know, you know, this, like, you know, but I would go and ask other people that have kids like some of my friends I went to high school with or even random people like on Facebook like hey does your kid does this or you know does your kid do this <laughs> but I would say um my grandmother was my number one go-to she was my number one so um I felt um like I said I wasn't really a baby person so I didn't um also because of my age I did not have many friends who had children or they had had children a long time ago. Um, so it was kind of that weird uh, place. Or I also feel like I didn't want to like bother them. Like, you know, I don't even remember asking Tuli too much. Like she's we had going through their own stuff. It's that <laughs> feeling of, you know, um, but I would have liked, I did take a class and I can't remember if it's at the Harlem Children's Zone. I know that it was good, but I wish that it was more practical as far as baby bottles and 
um, yeah, changing diapers. And, you know, it was on, it was on some other level. And I, don't, I think that information is always needed. Maybe it was safety or something. I can't even remember at this point, but I know that the practical stuff is what I really needed. Um, and because I'm my mom's, uh, you know, last child and I was, like I said, 35. So she was like, I don't remember nothing. I was like, that's not helping me. <laughs> that's my seats. We just put you out in the car and just, I'm like, you know, this is not going to work. <laughs> and it's supportive and loving, but information was just like, I don't even remember. We didn't do it like that. Um, so I wish there was a uh, more practical information um, other than the books because I read books I did I do remember I think Ricky it was Ricky Lake had a series about because um, I was very concerned about being a black woman um, being in an urban community and giving birth and this is a real issue that is not spoken about enough and that we are still dying at higher rates um, than um, than white women just giving birth in the you know best country in the world. Why is that? So and so I experienced all of these things. There was a um, a parenting group I think um, at Harlem Hospital, and I think that was good for some information. Again, get a little bit from here and a little bit from there. But um, the mother groups were very difficult as far as they were like either you must breastfeed or you know it was just like one extreme or the other. And I felt like, yeah, a lot of judgment if it was, or their child was their whole being. And I, you know, I was very clear that that was not, that was not going to be my life. <laughs> like you're a part of my life. I'm a parent now, but I think identity as a person is very important. And cause I think then we push all these things from ourselves to our children. Right. So that didn't work. I wound up sending a lot of messages on Facebook to, you know, my friends who, hey, what type of bottles did you like? And I would get, you know, four and five different things. What type of diapers are good? And I would kind of just go through, I call it the process of elimination. I try this, that didn't work for my child, so try something else. Um, but that was, that was helpful reading a lot. And like I said, as far as the pregnancy piece, um, I think Tuli and Melody said, I wish they would just tell women the stuff that your body goes through needs to be discussed <laughs> and, and in a safe space of this may happen and this may happen and this may happen because it can be truly like devastating <laughs> what is going on here. Um, you know, after the baby, how to take care of yourself. We talk about how to take care of baby, but you don't, you have to be educated on how to take care of yourself. And if you're not right, then again, how do you take care of another human being who needs you for everything? So um, more of that education, I really wanted to know. And I don't think I quite got those answers um, until, you know, you just kind of have to go through it. And like I said, my mother and everybody was supportive. My dad stayed with me for a while, but they don't know nothing. They went on me. <laughs> what, what? So I remember, I guess it was, <laughs> it was, you know, it was just that kind of like, okay, and is this supposed to happen? Why is my thigh black? I don't know. Like, <laughs> Um, you know, really, it isn't going to change after I have this baby, like seriously, somebody needs to tell me <laughs> what's going on. Um, and so, you know, I think, um, again, I, uh, videos about labor and, and educating yourself, I think is very important for any woman. Um, watching that series about, oh, they might try to induce you and do this and that, and what do you say and how do you advocate for yourself and how do you not, you know, and, and I did, and I felt really secure in that, oh, well, you're not breastfeeding, you have, you wait, it's gonna happen. <laughs> and, you know, just having that education, I think is important, um, especially as a black woman raising a black child, because that, that will come at you in all ways for the rest of our lives about how to advocate for ourselves and our children. Um, so again, just educating ourselves as much as possible. There's a lot on the internet. There's a lot, you know, of, I think, really good programs, but it is, it is a dig. And, you know, I wish it was a little bit easier to find your tribe, but it's, it's just not. And you have to kind of go through it and take the information. Like I said, um, Allison did, I put it on Facebook. Hey, what, that, these diapers aren't working. <laughs> this And, you know, people would give information. Oh, these bottles are good, but they, they take too long to clean. And, you know, and you find out those things are really, you know, helpful. So you, you do find it. It's just, it's just not the easiest thing, but I do wish that more people 
talk to women, especially when they're pregnant or right when they get pregnant about the changes your body goes through and how to self-care after your baby is born so that you can be, um, cause it's a lot of worry. I remember that first year is still a blur to me because I felt like I was always in like anxiety. Are you breathing? Are you eating enough? Are you sleeping? You know, it's just a constant, I've never been so worried in my whole life. <laughs> Even now the worries are different, but that first year is really like you're you know you know sleep you don't sleep because even sleeping is just like you got one ear open you got one eye open it's just it's that constant anxiety and I think that's already because of the baby we don't need to go through that about if our bodies are doing what it's supposed to do if it's healing okay so that would eliminate some of that stress I think um if we could have more support around the things that occur and that happen during pregnancy and after pregnancy. And lastly, I had a very difficult pregnancy. So I think um, the judgment that women give each other and I would see, oh, I had a perfect pregnancy. And I, said, and, you know, I wanted to throw up on them. I just couldn't take it. Like, I didn't, I didn't get, no, she didn't even know who I was. Like, to this day, I don't like them. <laughs> <laughs> I just go, that's great. <laughs> that's great. <laughs> Lucky you. And that's why I was one and done because I could not go through that again. <laughs> but, you know, the judgments that if we could support each other more and tell each other the truth about what those experiences look like. And after, you know, my cousin gave me a big old thing, a bucket. It was not the cutest uh, baby shower present or whatever but it had pads, it had stuff you needed in there. <laughs> like not that, you, and that I didn't know I needed at the time. And so, you know, like, you, like I said, and things to answer your question, you need bottles help and diapers help and all those things are very important. But, you know, what do you need for after birth to, to take care of yourself and your body and what things your body might go through during pregnancy is something women should be given. <laughs> like these things might happen and you're not going crazy. <laughs> Are we missing anybody for uh, before we move on? Questions uh, that you ask people? I'll chime in. Um, again, everything that you all have said is uh, it's funny. It's not funny in the, in the sense that it's very true. Uh, my wife and I were just talking about that yesterday, how there should be some level of, um, uh, I guess, ad advocacy for mental health for mothers in this, because of all everything that is going through in this process, um, my my wife suffered from postpartum depression, and it was in it when when I was saying like that first year of anxiety, like you really made me think of it from that perspective, and like 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 she, my kudos to my wife because she did majority of the brunt work, getting up, the changing, that type of thing, so I can just go to work, and so like that's a um, it's something that again is not necessarily it's it's definitely glossed over in that regard. Um, but the, the questions that I had was more so in the sense of like, how to be a better advocate for, for my child from a health perspective. Um, because I understood the, I looked at the numbers, we found that we were having a boy. I'm like, oh, here comes autism or like the, the, you, you become aware of these things and you're like, I don't want to, I don't want to do anything that messes my child up. So I was big on like at, having the conversation about vaccination, um, understanding that the MMR uh, was given to us. I'm 35, so the MMR was given to me in three, in, in separate doses. It's like they were. It was not a cocktail how it's given to children today, and so I was having those type of conversations. Um, couldn't have those conversations with uh, our parents because our we we live a lifestyle different than our parents. Like my wife and I were both plant based. Um, you know, again, my both of our folks are part of the Southern migration. So, you know, they brought what they brought that that southern soul food with them. And so like those are something that's true and true. So when we were making some lifestyle changes, they were questioning, like, well, why are you doing that? Or why are you doing this? Or why you can't have and then, you know, and, and to a degree they would make fun of us, like, well, we can't eat, you can't have this, can't have that. And it was like, well, it's one of these things where, you know, you feel be you feel yourself being patronized by, you know, your your loved ones because of the choice that you make as a as a parent. So then you're like, ah, I can't really ask them this. So then you, I, we lived to your, you know, our, our peer group, so to speak. And so, but one of my my friends gave me a, 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 a nice list of books to read from a father's perspective. Um, and that was really helpful. And obviously some of the stuff you're able to cherry pick, some of the stuff you're like, okay, maybe this doesn't work. And then some of the stuff you have to look at it from the cultural perspective is how does this work in, in my walk as being a black man and raising a black, a black son as well. So it's, it was those type of things. Um, 
but yeah, that main thing was just about being, how am I being a best advocate for him um, as it pertains to, you know, going to those doctors, those doctors uh, 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 appointments and making sure that they're not just doing whatever they want because it's a quota in that regard. So it was a lot of, a lot of reading on that aspect as well. I could so, just say one thing about yes. what John said. I think it's so important to be, if you're, I'm, I'm already like, you know, I say what I want to say, but that's just my personality. A lot of people, that's not their personality. So saying like, I need it, like I changed my pediatrician. I did not, I, did, I was not for her. She was, it was not going to work, right? So um, <laughs> I, I think a lot of parents, May, who who don't have that personality, right? Who want still want the best for their children and kind of get stuck, right? Believing that you're a doctor, you you I, I'm not a doctor. You should you know I trust you with this information. So I think around advocacy and education, though I'm not a doctor, I I, I know that 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 ain't right, <laughs> and that we might not be seeing eye to eye, especially when it comes about immunizations and things that are, are very important. And the doctor that I chose, she said, look, I don't care how you want to do it. We can, as long as you want to do it, I'm for it. We can spread it out. We can, you know, and that's what I appreciated. Um, you know, I thought might be like, oh, your child has diaper rash. I said, that's impossible. I'm a stay at home mom. I change these diapers when there's nothing there to find out. The new doctor said, no, he has eczema. So, I mean, I think it's really, you know, to go through these things, like I'm not crazy. I say this a lot because again, that first year you feel crazy. <laughs> Okay, you feel off your rocker. Something is not quite right. Even when you're happy, it's not about being unhappy and happy. We also have to change that that conversation. I was happy. I was blessed. I was grateful, but I felt crazy most of the time. <laughs> and so changing this doctor and she goes, no, this is eczema. You know, oh, you need to change diapers. You need to, you know, just throw these out. These are not going to work. Try these plant-based or this and that. You know, so um, empowering parents, empowering parents to feel okay, feel feel all right to say something is not right. I'm not, I might not be getting the best information. Let me ask somebody else. Let me go to somebody else. I think is is extremely important, and not not enough of us, um, black and brown people, feel that power to do that with our children. Absolutely. Um, I, I do, so there's a controversial question I was pondering and I don't, I, I will pose it and then pivot if it doesn't make sense to you guys. But do you guys have a parenting or identify with a parenting style? Did you like model your own style after anyone or like a, like a parenting mentor, or does that not make sense to you because there is no parenting style? Um, and hop in, Melody, it seems like you wanna <laughs> hop in first. Yeah, um, you know, I, I kind of feel like here in California, it's really big on parenting labels. Uh, okay. Living in other places, uh, California isn't the only state I've ever lived in. I, um, I was born in Texas, lived there, so I was about 11 and then I lived in Michigan, um, Saginaw, Michigan for um, about 12 years of my life. And then when I became, I think it was like 24 when I moved to California. And so um, I didn't, I never heard of crunchy moms, granola moms, things like that. I never did, I really didn't. And you know, it wasn't until I moved to California and then they're like, oh, well, I'm a helicopter mom. And I'm like, I'm just, I'm just a fucking mom. Okay, I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> I don't know what to say. I'm just a mom trying to do my best for my kids. You know what I mean? And I don't, you know, because I, I take bits and pieces from, you know, all different perspectives and I apply it to what I think is going to work best for me and my family, you know? And it's a, it's a conversation that, you know, my husband and I are constantly in because, you know, like I said, it's always changing. It's, you know, as your kid gets older and they start being introduced to elements outside of your home is a huge thing is, you know, being mindful of what your kids are being exposed to when you're not around them is scary on so many levels, but, you know, it's constantly having that conversation. And so how do we address certain things, you know? And so, you know, <laughs> those labels, ugh, I could, I could happily live the rest of my life without being 
under this particular umbrella of a certain type of mom because you know a lot of times I feel like I'm a hot mess mom <laughs> so you know and it's okay and that's a perfect that's a beautiful thing about it is that even if you are feeling like you're a hot mess and all it is okay because as long as you keep your kids interests at heart you know and trying to do the best for them you know it it's okay so yeah those those labels really get under my skin after a while so I I try not to um really I try to stay away from a lot of people that put themselves under them like no no we can't we can't hang because you're really not going to like me once you get to know me (laughs) you know I'm I'm so glad that you asked this I I wouldn't say it's controversial I mean it might be down and dirty but you know I love them kind of questions (laughs) I'm, I, you know, it's funny, like I'm, I'm a psych professor, right? And I'm also a mental health professional. So I teach human development, like I teach parental styles. And I always have like this chuckle under me. And like, I think one time I was teaching it uh, this semester. And I'm like, why do you have like this underlying like, look, because I don't use none of that. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> I teach an intro to psych, I don't use a darn thing. Okay, I throw that out the window. Parenting for me is like gumbo, you know what I'm saying? So I got some sausage from my mama. I got, you know, some shrimp from my parents, you know what I'm saying? And I've had to put that all together because, you know, time evolves, you know what I'm saying? So when my grandmother was going up, you know, they were working the land, you know, they were sharecroppers and and different things. And, you know, now I'm an educator in a space that hates black educators you know what i'm saying so my gumbo has to flow differently so the styles and models i don't use any of them you know i think that it's important that that we use value systems as a guide right so my value system is very african-centered right so you know i look at my son being emotionally expressive you know being artistic you know being able to understand his culture so anything that fits within my value system, then I incorporate it. So that's what I've had to do. So I got I got this cultural gumbo. And if I feel it fits within in that, um, you know, I, I let it work. Both me and my wife, um, parents divorced. My parents divorced very late in my life. And my, my, my wife's parents divorced very, divorced very early. So like I said, there was some intentionality like, oh, uh, we're not doing that. <laughs> you know, so we had a list of things that were modeled for us that we were not doing. And now that my son is six, I think my mom is just just starting to see, oh, he didn't want to listen to me on this. But look at how these situations turned out. You know, so I've had to do a lot of that gumbo mix and just keep my value system and then things that me and my wife feel fit within our family flow, then we incorporate. But but every time I teach human development, y'all, I'm just laughing through the whole lesson because I teach it and I don't even use it. Mm. Hey, <laughs> that's why I was like, I might have to retract the question if everybody's like, no. <laughs> so, okay. Uh, next up, anybody want to share on like parenting styles? Do you identify with one or is it kind of like that doesn't really register? Go, go ahead, Tuli. Well, with me, um, coming from an Indian background, we're very, particularly my family, I can't say all Indian people, but we're very soft. Like we're very, you know, woo woo everything. What happened? You broke. Oh my God. Ah. You know, or my husband's Caribbean culture. <laughs> they are super like, what happened? You broke your That's nice. Okay, go get some alcohol. You know, <laughs> like so it was like I'm coming from like, especially my first was a boy. So I'm always like hovering and oh my God, are you okay? Or like extra comfort, extra empathy. You know, that's how I just grew up and I grew up around a lot of women um and my husband you know grew up a lot of uh although women but he could that culture is very different so um it was nice having he's more of the i guess the bad cop and i'm the good cop as they say so you know it was nice coming together to um put those two different styles together for our kids um but it's it's funny um ed said about the uh education because my cousin is also a psychology professor and <laughs> she was miss I mean, you're, you're great that you're like i just put it to the side and i just do the gumbo that's beautiful my cousin was like i know everything i'm a psych professor you know <laughs> and it, 
should always be giving me stupid ass advice and i'd be just like no i don't care what piaget said or whatever said like that ain't working for me man so you know it was it's kind of cool though learning and i'm still learning i'm still learning my husband's ways he's learning some of to soften up a little bit and we're just merging together and it's it's great and we're also learning from our parents a little bit you know they're liars they did a lot of things when we were kids and now they're like no i never did that it's, yes you did you pulled my ear across three rooms yes you did so you know it's, it's a lot of fun going through this process <laughs> oh my gosh <laughs> Thank you. Uh, hop on in. Are you, you want to uh, pull somebody in and say <laughs> you were lying too? Go on. You got the floor. <laughs> and grandparents be on some grandparents is a whole nother show. They have amnesia. Like, I don't know what. I'm like, oh, he can do whatever. Like, you ain't do none of this with, with us. What happened? They all just go ahead, do whatever. That is um, completely um, hilarious. Um, parenting styles. I, I read some books and um, I think maybe it should be like child centered. I think uh, depending on who your child is, the parenting style you should look to. Maybe if it was that way, I could, I could buy in a little more because, you know, even like we we're talking about earlier, though, you know yourself, whether you know yourself or not, being a parent to whatever child you have is might be throw all that out the window. It might be not useful at all or that does not work. Um, like I said, I've worked with middle school and high school. I'm very direct. I'm very, this is this is how it is. You know, to, I talk to you, you talk to me. You understand the words that come out of my mouth. I'm a fire sign. My son is also a fire sign and we are like a combustible. <laughs> like, it could go down. <laughs> And so you have to learn, like, even if my parenting style or personality is one, like, I always ask, is it working, right? So if something is not working, you got to readjust. And it's very difficult. Like, right now, I'm the, you know, the good cop, bad cop, um, the bad cop. <laughs> so I'm like, mm -mm, that don't fly. I'm not having it. No. <laughs> you know, and I get from my mother from my partner, from everybody, that's your child. Like he can spit it out just as fast as I can do it. I'm like, you see yourself in this spitting image of a mirror and you go, okay, I'm gonna have to do some things a little different. Um, and pressure, I don't think, I think parenting styles also comes from pressure, whether you had a father there or mother there, what kind of parents your parents were. My parents were like awesome. So I felt like a lot of pressure, like I can't do it how they did it. I don't know how, this is a different child. I don't know what I'm supposed to do. This is a different era of parenting. It, what they did or work may not, you know, it doesn't always translate. So I kind of, I like the gumbo. It's like I take a little bit of what they did that I felt worked, but my child is a very different child than, than someone else. So it's like, you know, kind of playing that. I wish they had the, the children and then whatever type of child you have, how that, how, what parenting style might be better for that child, right? Um, mm -hmm. Instead of just being the parenting style, the helicopter that might drive, you know, that would drive somebody like my son crazy because he's independent and needs to be, you know, that would not work. <laughs> so um, parenting styles, I don't think, I think they they meant their mates make uh, people feel better or parents feel better or find their tribe perhaps, but I don't know if they actually work in the sense of practic practicality. And again, you, the only way you know that is is it working with your child? And every child is different. So, you know, your son is going to be very different from your daughter, or you know, the second daughter may be different from the baby. So, um, I think like we've been saying, it's a constant, you know, reevaluation, a constant phase of you know how to go this week <laughs> and, and readjusting of you know maybe the gumbo's too hot <laughs> we gotta make it a little sweeter or something like that you know what i mean it's a constant because they will throw it back at us <laughs> for sure absolutely um hop on in the rest of y'all um 
it's okay to say if it doesn't make sense. I feel like that's <laughs> that's been a through line for the river. Um, I don't I don't identify with that. It is okay. <laughs> I would Very say sad. I don't have like oh I'm sorry, I was no. Oh, I Are was just good? Y'all both about to say no, so go ahead and say it. <laughs> I'm like, there's no way to say, like, how to be a parent. It's just, like, you go with the flow. Like, if, you know, every kid is different. Just like you said, every kid is different. One kid throws a tantrum worse than the other. So it's like, you don't want to yell at them. You're like, okay, well, maybe I should just ask them calmly. But then there's the one kid, like, no, you need to sit down right now. You know, so it's like, I would say it does depend on the kid and how's your day going. And I, I wouldn't say I would read a book about how to parent my kid you know I wouldn't I mean it's good to take advice and everything but every kid is different it's a new day every day when was this when did they write this book because <laughs> kids nowadays they're like <laughs> they're TikTok they're doing this they're doing that we didn't have that you know so I would say you would just take it day by day that's how I feel about it because I'm not like an I, I yell at her sometimes not yelling at her but I try to say okay she's sensitive she's a human just like me I can't just yell at her when she's wrong you know it's like you know you're frustrated and you know being human you were like hey what are you doing you know but it's like okay hey what are you doing try to figure out why they're doing it why did you do that you know so I would say take it I take it day by day that's what I think John no no comma what's the rest of you <laughs> oh, yeah it, yeah it's, it's it's pretty much the same in the sense of like you know again he Langston acts totally different with me than he does with Santana. So for me, it's it's in this understanding that like he give he he tap dances on her nerves, whereas I can literally just give him one look, like like li literally, Sammy, literally, we I can be on a client call, and he's cool, and I hear something, and he I look at him, he's he just takes off and get his, get his leaves the room, like he's out of here, no problem, no questions asked. Now as soon as you know, as soon as my wife comes home. He's literally like right there on her hip the whole time. And it's like, and he becomes this needy child. And it's like, I'm sitting there like, fam, you weren't doing this six hours ago. <laughs> what is this? And so, so for me, it's, it's, it's and then it's the, the thing about it, like, I don't think parenting styles work because, well, one, neither one of us were parented in those same styles that have been defined. So then there, there's that part, like, so it's naturally not, it's not innate for us. Um, and then the idea of understanding that, you know, well, in one book I read that, you know, you're, you're raising another human, you're not raising yourself. So it is giving that, giving this child this ability, this space to then grow, evolve, learn how to process these emotions, learn how to, to communicate in that regard. We have to give them that space to do so. And so I think it's, it's, it's the journey and understanding that it's very fluid. Like, like, like Nia said, you got to sometimes turn up the temperature or turn down the temperature on the gumbo in that regard. And so that's, that is what, I think parenting style really is, it's just learning on the fly because it's it's not hard baked, it's not hard lined in because the, the craziest thing for me is as you're, I mean, the pandemic has shown me a lot being that I've been home with him every day and every day I'm noticing how much more this personality is starting to sharpen, how much more of me he's start, is my me that's coming out. And I'm like, oh, I have to discipline me now because that was me when I was a child and now I see that like now, like that part. So it's like per personality styles don't attribute to the fact that you're looking at his personality evolve on the fly. So I, I just think that it's one of those things where, like was said, it was it, it's it's probably something that's made up to placate to help people find their tribe and, and help identify kind of like a Myers Briggs. But is it really true, like hard line, something that you can just say base your whole parental experience from? And I, I don't think that that's truly the case. Mm. Well, help me with my look, John, because when I started parenting, my son, my wife called me Mr. Funtime. Every time I look at him, he laughs. I'm giving him the best stare down. He just bring me into him. So, um, you know, one of the yeah. things that John said about, <laughs> go ahead. I was going to say, I, I don't know where that came. So I think that that thing did come from my mom. So my okay. mom ruled, my mom came, my mom was the, once you get a certain age, I can't physically dominate you. Yeah. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to psychologically, I'm psychologically check you. And so with, okay. and, okay. and the thing that I, we've had the kind of, so there's no, uh, we don't, we don't believe in capital punishment in, in the house. So it's interesting because even though I, we both grew up that way, getting spankings, we both did, but we don't like, we, we understand that spankings may have been a little OD on our end when we take a, a, a 50,000 foot level and really unpack it. So 
We're like, we won't do that. We'll figure out a different way, which we have. But for me, it's tone. And it's like, I, I, I don't know what it is. I, I don't know how, it's just a hard look at it. And I look him square in his face and he's like, all right, let me just not, I, I don't, I don't want to figure out what that look is about. I'm, I'm out of here. And then he just takes off running. The tone works for me. Like I still ain't mastered the look. I mean, he just laughs at my looks, but I, I have varied my tone. And, you know, one of the things that being in, in the pandemic, you know, has taught me is how much we were missing in raising our kids having to work every day, right? And so like I underestimated like, wow, I have time. <laughs> we, we can do activities. Like I can talk about my life now. So I, I will never go back to, to how I was parenting before the pandemic. It wasn't bad, but I will never go back to some of those strategies that we, that we were doing before the pandemic hit, because I think we have a better family flow on knowing our son's needs now. Awesome. I mean, you guys have shared so many gems and I, I just wanna ask a final question that, for you guys to reflect on. I know it's been a deep night, but <laughs> how has parenting changed you? And what does that look like? I, 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 I was like, what? I was like, where? I mean, why are the crickets? Scared, everybody, everybody, everybody got the in. crickets I wireless. Know. Go ahead, Ed. Let, let, I let, mean, let. parenting has made me more relaxed. You know, like you know, being an educator, being you know, rule driven sometimes. Like I love being a father. You know what I'm saying? Like I love it. I mean, it has brought out you know the best in me. Um, it has it has made me more understanding. It has made me more compassionate. You know, I teach better now that I'm a parent because I have a different understanding of how the world works. I'm more empathetic. I'm less hard on myself. And I enjoy life more. Like what having a son and a black son made me realize the luxury of time. Like time is a luxury. So now I want to maximize the moments in my life and the moments in his life so they're more productive. So parenting probably was the best thing that happened to me. And I, I feel I've matured in ways that I needed to mature, but a child facilitated that growth faster. Wow. I'm going to have to agree with that. Uh, same thing with me. I, I didn't have any patience before, um, you know. <laughs> Uh, I, I was a singer and I, I lost my voice because I was yelling so much <laughs> all the time, you know, uh, so I had to learn. You, you don't have to speak that way. You bring it down. The look, I'm working on that look now, John. So, because <laughs> I too, I'm 5'2 and my husband's six. So I know these kids are going to shoot past me and I'm going to have to do that look because the strength is not going <laughs> to affect me. Um, and uh I, I also learned, I actually, I went through some uh, personal therapy too, just to grow, because I didn't grow up with, you know, our dad. So I had to learn a lot of that. And the kids made me, you know, society generally says, yeah, go see a therapist, but it's not looked upon like, oh, there's something really wrong with you if you go see a therapist. But I proudly say I did go see a therapist. I got self-help and my children, both of them, mostly my son being the first, um, held our marriage together, held myself together, you know, made me be a better person. I, like today, you know, I know so much more. I'm transitioning from an actor to be a teacher now. So I, I have love for kids and love for education. You know, I just, this new me developed and it's amazing just if I stand back and look at myself where I used to be 20 years ago and where I am today, I give a lot of kudos to my kids for that like they they made me forced me to grow and i'm so thankful for that that's beautiful i would agree with her um my daughter again i'm young so me being a first time mom my life changed completely i would say like i learned a lot of patience i learned how to love someone more than i ever loved i guess i i would say uh, of course we love our parents and everything but it's just another person that i've created and i love her and i just 
I thank her because I could have been out partying with my friends, you know, 20, 21, 22, you're out, you're drinking, you're having fun, you're wilding me, I'm at home with my kid, I'm, you know, I had, I was forced to start working, I had to stop school for a second to focus on making money for my kid because I'm doing it by myself, I couldn't go to school, so it's like now my life, I'm 24 now, I just, I'm happy that I went through the phase of having a kid because now it's like once she's at, once I'm at like 30, it's like, okay, I'm, I could do what I need to do now. Like, and I still have so much time to do that. Like I have so much time. So I would say, I'm glad that I got it out the way and I'm learning as a first time mom. And I, it really did change me, it made me stronger. I, it forces me like, okay, you may not want to work today, but you, you have to feed her. So <laughs> you have to pay rent. You have to do this. You have to do that. So I would say it gave me a good push start. That's what I would say. Even though it was forced, <laughs> it was a forced start. <laughs> I think I would say uh, one to co to piggyback on what everyone's saying because those things are very true in the sense of uh, patience and and and, and selflessness. Um, but I would say purpose. Um, again, for because for me, one of the main things I, I didn't really have like what I deem successful doesn't have to do with anything that I do from a career perspective. So like fatherhood was something that I really wanted to be a part of, and so. So for me, and now I have the ability to be a father. Um, so I'm looking at it from the perspective of it's now my responsibility to get this right. So it was a lot of self, you know, introspective, you know, looking at, you know, digging out the closet, what making sure before he gets here, whatever I have, the, the these, whatever idiosyncrasies I have that I need to get rid of prior to him coming, because I don't want to pass it on to him. Let me get, let me figure that out. And then even to the point now, same thing now, I, I, you know, we talked, touched on therapy, going to, I got a therapist, um, going to see a therapist and talking about some of these things that were, that helped shape me and how I grew into adulthood and making sure that I still, even though I have ways that I've coped through them and actually used them to propel me, make sure I still don't pass that to him because he doesn't necessarily need that, uh, not trigger or, or trait he he just doesn't need it he he has his own palette his own play, his own slate so my job is to best better myself in which his presence has done that for me because again it's made me now realize oh it's not about me no more it's about whatever i can give to him like my goal is to be able to say i can leave him something and if he wants to build upon it he can if he wants to fumble it and and, and destroy it he can either way it goes it's his he has something that I gave him for his, uh, in, in terms of when he starts off and he has a better footing than I had coming up. And so like, it's, it's all about being future focused and focused on that type of uh, legacy, so to speak, so. Absolutely. It's, it's a hop in. Naya, did you wanna? I'm, I'm going to keep it all the way 100 as usual. No, I have not gained any more patience than I had before. And I, I don't know when it's going to come. I've been waiting. It's not here. Um, it is probably my biggest struggle. I don't know. Maybe it's just not in my DNA. I, I don't have it. I'm sorry. I wish I did. I, I hear y'all talking about patience. Where is it? Can somebody get it for me? Can I purchase it? I think you saying that because I was sitting here like, oh, oh I got more patience. I'm like, that's that's great because I am not a patient person. No, I am and not. I'm like, I said it, make me say it again, and I'm I'm about this. I have no more patience for the day. It is gone, and I'm honest with it. And so I need you to pay attention. I say, read the room. My patience is zero. <laughs> so come with me. Help me out. Um. So I am, I, this is hard. This is the hardest job I've ever had is to be a parent. It's the hardest thing um, ever because again, it's constantly changing and you have a whole life that you're in charge of. And then they have their own needs and wants and, you know, purpose and personality. And so it's like trying to, you know, make this, you know, see that have this person see, you know, to be a good person. <clears throat> and parenting is a lot, a lot of modeling, you know, that's why I'm honest with I'm like, look, I don't have no patience today. I, I need you to step, I need you to get it, get with me <laughs> because I, I don't have it today. Right. Um, so it's taught me a lot about myself. It's, um, 
made me be more compassionate. Um, so patient, no, but compassionate, yes, because I do step back and think about, okay, how are, how is he feeling? How does he look at the world? How does he feel in this situation? Um, and I don't know if um, I had that before. So um, in, in this way, and, you know, just about, you know, loving somebody so much that you cannot, you know, that it's still that worry of, I, I want you to be okay. I'm, I'm being a lioness, let somebody come for my chop. You know, it's that mama bear thing, you know, that you didn't even know you ready to go for if, if your family is hurt, right? If you're, you know, so um, I think that's been, that that has been just phenomenal. And the joy, you know, as much as I say, like, I, I keep it real, this is hard. Some days it's harder than others, but it's also extremely joyous. Um, and the purpose um, that John was talking about, for me, sometimes it's, I don't want to get out of bed, but that person makes me get out of bed, right? And go, oh my God, you're so funny, or this and that, or, or just how they see the world sometimes, and they say something, you go, what? <laughs> it's just like, you know, it, it makes it so much more interesting. Um, and I feel really blessed um, to have the opportunity because I think it's, it's, you know, it's everybody, unfortunately, can't have children or don't want to or whatever that, I think it just opens up life you know, in a different way. And um, you can, you know, be aunties and all that. And I think you can be fulfilled that way as well. But there's nothing compared to, you know, giving life to and then seeing it grow and then having an effect on someone's life, right? Um, whether you give birth to them or not, just being there every day and sustaining and, and learning and, and, you know, trying to, you know, rear them the right way through all the good and the bad. So I think, you know, the joy is what I think of, the purpose is what I think of, even through, you know, I, I just don't want to sugarcoat it because it's hard. And even my purpose has changed because like, you know, we are artists and trying to, you know, write and sing and direct and do all these things. And then now it's something else. You have to figure out now, what is my purpose, right? Where, where does God want me to be? Where does the universe want me to be? And what do I need to be for my child? Right. So um, I think that's ever changing, too. And I think it's OK to not to not know sometimes, <laughs> especially for us controlling people to just not know and be in that moment where our children are. Right. That this we're, we're going through it with them. And. Um, and yeah, so it's, 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 a, it's a roller coaster ride, but we here. <laughs> we're doing the best we can. <laughs> Amen. Uh, Melody. Other than your patience is shot too. <laughs> My patience with this mute button is about to go out the door. <laughs> no, you know what? Um, yeah, patience is not a strong suit of mine. Um, you know, I got my patience wasn't much there before kids. I'll be honest with that part of it because I kind of like Naya. Um, I, I wasn't much of a kid person before I had kids. I mean, I had nieces and nephews, and I love those kids I'm very particular with the kids I choose to like <laughs> and so I I really wasn't a huge kid person before my kids and so um that's something that I'm still working on each day is to um keep that in line and not be you know um just you kids <laughs> you know and I got three of them and they're they're all very close in age so my kids are roughly two, two and a half years apart. So, you know, when my husband and I decided to have kids, you know, I was like, okay, we're kind of doing this a little bit later than most of our friends had. Most of our friends, you know, God, I'm tripping out that I have friends whose kids are graduating high school now. And I'm like, all right, I got little ones. Like I got a four year old, you know? So it kind of trips me out a little bit. And, um, you know, one thing to go along with that, um, you know, understanding the time that you have with your kids and stuff like that. And reminding myself too, you know, it's very true what a lot of older people say, like, it's gone in a flash, like, before you know it, they're this age, and they're doing that. And so, you know, um, trying, you know, trying to step back from the moment, and realizing that, you know, this is, this is just a smidge of, you know, of their life, you know, I always say, like, you know, childhood, um, no, I heard somebody else say it, actually, that childhood is the shortest period of their life when you think about it, you know, 18, we're adults, and then we're adults for the rest of our lives. But, you know, from the time they're born to 18 years old, that's childhood. And so, you know, it, it 
you have to remind yourself constantly. And sometimes you need somebody else to remind you. So my husband does that for me a lot. He's, he's the patient one. Oh my goodness. So I was like, I look at him like, how? <laughs> it's like, oh, I'm not always the patient one, but do I have my moments with my kids? Obviously, you know, my kids are, my kids are pretty good kids. And, you know, I try my best. Um, one of the things I also wanted to mention along with that, along with, you know, the time being so precious with them is, you know, for me is realizing my own mortality when having kids. I, it, it was an awakening. It really was. And it's, it was scary at the same time to realize like, wow, like at any moment I might not be here, <laughs> you know, for them. And so at the same time, you have to put the bigger picture, like how can I make the most of this? How can I give them everything they need, the nurturing they need, the love that they need, you know, the um, grace that they need? Because sometimes even as a parent, you don't have grace for yourself. So it's hard to give it to somebody else sometimes, you know? And so it's, you know, you're trying to put all this together, like wrap it all up together and, you know, help this little being be the best that they can because all you, you know, I think, you know, I really just want really good people. You know, I want my kids to grow up and I look at them and say, you know what, we had some bumps, but they're good people and they have good hearts and they love other people for who they are and not their status, their color, things like that. You know what I mean? It's Because it's so hard, especially for us as people of color, you know, we know the negative end of that. And so trying to teach my kids, hey, like we're all different and it's beautiful and it's glorious. And you know, that's how it should be. And don't let anybody in this world tell you that it shouldn't be that way. It's, it's chaos, but it's a beautiful, beautiful chaos. I, I think most of us can agree that sometimes it's just so much all together, but I wouldn't trade it. I have, I mean, being a mom has definitely, you know, it, it gave me something, I guess, for most of them. It, it gave you a sense of being. And even though you're still trying to figure out who you are in that role, I, I wouldn't trade it because, man, it, it's amazing. It's such a beautiful thing to live and to experience and to do it with my kids, you know, because this is a lifelong relationship I have now with these little people. <laughs> They're not going anywhere. So. <laughs> oh, man. You know what? Thank you, Pastor Melody, uh, for right? stepping step to the altar. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, I don't know if you'll have any other gems to share, but I did want to open the floor to anyone that wanted to share some final thoughts um, or final like advice for expecting parents, um, either in the same, uh, or expecting parents or people who are uh, who have kids in the same age group as you to just, just some quick quick little uh, advice some little points and then we will head on out so I think for the married folks stick to your plan uh, understand that you are whatever your plan is that you all have stick to it make sure that you too is you know Cat Williams always talk about you're, you're a star player even though you, you know y'all too have to make sure that y'all y'all star playing again yeah, find some individual time for yourself but then make sure that you two are actually still communicating the best because it's you, it's you two both are pouring into this child. And I think that um, being a, a, in one accord on that regard means a lot. And, and you're going to have the folks, especially, you know, you may have family um, that may disagree with some of the, the methods that you do have in that manner. That's fine. It's okay. Everyone's entitled to their opinion, but just, you know, understand that, stand firm in your beliefs and however you all want to go about it, because it can be, it can be daunting, especially um, I think it's more daunting um, on the on the woman than it is the man, uh, obviously, because there's there's a lot more because I, I, I used to joke with, 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 with Santana. I said, you know, I'm not I'm not important right now. I mean, yeah, sure. Like I just I just hold them and feed them occasionally. But you are the most important thing. You're the most important parent right now, as you know, when he when Blanks was a child. But then, you know, as he's gotten older, got a little more mobile, got things of that manner, you know, I then now started to see my true purpose and role in that regard but I, again just making sure that you all are working and moving as a unit you all will be fine i would say prioritize self-care uh just like it's a job like the self-care piece the mental health piece is very important so uh you know whatever self-care looks like for you like i meditate sweet pea on the weekends jazz Whatever I got to do to maintain a sense of emotional balance um, is part of the process, but I don't think that's heard enough. Parents, self-care, self-care. Do it again one more time. Self-care. Self-care. <laughs> oh, man, oh, man. 
hop on in for your final thoughts. Um, I think that uh, also, you know, I definitely agree with the self-care. Absolutely. Um, I wish I had more people tell me that earlier on. Um, and uh, I think also just ask questions. Like I used to be that kid in the front of the class, always raising my hand, you know, everybody hated, but I got all my answers and all the other kids benefited from me asking all the questions, mm -hmm. right? But don't be afraid to ask questions. There's no such thing. And I know it's cliche, no, no such thing as a stupid question. It really isn't. There's all these crazy questions out there. And like Naya said, we all feel like we're lunatics uh, the first year of pregnancies and first year of you know, raising that baby. You don't know what the F you're doing. So <laughs> no matter how much advice you get, you know, so just ask, 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 ask as many questions as many people, and then you determine what you want to keep and what you want to throw away. But ask, don't be afraid to ask, because then then you're not being true to yourself. The power of the ask. Yes, de definitely. And on any part of your life, the power of the ask. Who's next? Who's who's hopping in? Allison, go ahead, go ahead, <laughs> go ahead, Allison. Okay. Um, I don't really have much to say because, you know, um, I, we everybody covered everything. I would say self-care because it's been times, like, again, I do this by myself. So it's been times where I'm like, I can't do this today. I I just need, I need a break. I need to go drop her off. Can, can somebody watch her for an hour? I need to have a drink. I need some wine. I need something. So I would say self-care most definitely remember to get dressed and do your makeup still like I stopped doing makeup stop just I just stopped working out I stopped doing a lot of things I used to do but I would say self-care for sure is like very important mentally um physically just all around the board self-care but still take care of the kids too <laughs> <laughs> go ahead Naya you 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 moving like you ready to hop in <laughs> I don't know, I'm um, I mean everything that's been stated self-care I think even take it further to find your happy place because I think happy, happy parent, happy child. I, I don't, you know, that is just so important. It doesn't mean we don't show our children other emotions, but you know, when we're happy, nine times out of 10, they're happy. And I think have, we don't value happiness enough. <laughs> like it's a, uh, you know, especially for black and brown children, let them be children, let them be happy. You know, I had to find my silly place you know, as a parent to just get down and kind of be silly with them. And I think that's, that's hugely important. Um, so, and I'm still finding things that make me happy, whether it's career or whatever, some people are just fine, happy is just being a parent or mom or dad, like John said, that was his thing, you know, but some, you're, that might not be everyone. So find something else that, you know, really gets that out of you. So your children see that too. And um, that's what I'm, I'm finding. And someone said this, well, my partner said this, um, that soon you won't be able to pick them up. And I was just like, what? <laughs> like, you know, when Millie's talking about time, you go, yeah, he's already half, <laughs> he's already half my size. <laughs> I am thinking he wants to take you to bed too much longer, right? So, um, I, I think to cherish those moments because it does go by so fast. Um, so I, I'm, I'm kind of remembering those right now to cherish these moments because soon, you know, time flies. So self-care, find your happy place, ask questions uh, for the pregnancy and first year and after, don't be hard on yourself. Just, this, is, <laughs> this is difficult, don't be hard on yourself. Um, you know, we and find your tribe, but it may not be right away that you find, but find your people, find your people, your parenting people, your whoever, find your people that you can cry to, that you can laugh to, that will tell you about the crazy shit they kids did so you don't feel about yourself. Find your tribe, you need them to, to call and say, what the heck did he just do? My child put a razor in his head and cut a block of his hair. I was about to take him to the doctor thinking he had alopecia. No, he just put the razor on his head. You know, you got to tell these things to somebody and they go, well, you guess what such and such did. You need that feedback. You need that, you know, camaraderie. You need that parenting space. So find, find your village. I think it's so helpful and it's so powerful and trust your instinct. Absolutely. All right, bring us home, Pastor Melody. <laughs> You're the last one. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. 
I'm like so much pressure now. <laughs> no, you know what? I mean, honestly, everybody has said basically everything I feel. I mean, um, just to piggyback off of John and what he said, you know, sticking to your plan, um, you know, new couples about to have their kids have those hard conversations about how you want to raise your kids, uh, whether you're in line with how you want to feed them, how you want to discipline them, spirituality in any form, have those conversations. That is really difficult to pick up the pace after your kid is here, because if you both are on different spectrums, it's not saying that you can't fix it after the point, but it, it makes it a lot harder. And so, you know, my husband and I definitely had a lot of, um, a lot of conversations on what we expected to do as parents together because you know we all we both have our own influences on our kids but as a whole what are we both standing for what are we going to accept as a family what we're not going to accept as a family when it comes to character behavior and you know for a lot of people spirituality is a is a big thing especially when you can have couples with totally different cultures that are coming together you know that's a huge thing that I noticed with among friends that you know however you believe is you know, that's perfectly fine, but make sure that you guys find a balance with it and you understand and respect each other in it. I mean, guys, <laughs> thank you. Thank you all for joining me. Uh, <laughs> this was more than I can tell you uh, just for someone who does not have kids. This was eye-opening in many respects. Uh, so I appreciate each and every one of you. I am Sammy Ash, the Executive Director the Ash Academy, and I thank you all for joining us once again. Bye. Bye.